I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Salvatore Pais, an aerospace engineer and inventor who's achieved notoriety for his patents and patent applications, which include piezoelectricity-induced room temperature superconductor, plasma compression fusion device, electromagnetic field generator, craft using an inertial mass reduction device, and a high-frequency gravitational wave generator. Dr. Pice currently works for the United States Space Force with previous experience as a scientist and aerospace engineer at the U.S. Navy's Naval Air Station at Potuxent River. Dr. Pice has both a master's and a Ph.D. in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Case Western Reserve University, in addition to his extensive career in the U.S. military. So I do want to put a disclaimer in. Dr. Pice is joining us in a private capacity today, the views and opinions he shares do not necessarily represent those of the U.S. Navy, Space Force, or federal government. So, Sal, welcome. It is truly, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you with me. And you and I have been talking for, I think, what, three or four years now, right? Off and on. Yes, sir. So, yes. Um, my, it's, it's my honor and privilege to be with you, Tim. You've, uh, Put it this way, you have uh, interviewed far, far more uh, worthy people. I mean, uh, Sir Martin Rees for one, my goodness. I mean, the Astronomer Royal. How how, how were you able to lock an interview with him? Oh, uh, very hard to get. Well, yeah, yeah uh, Martin Rees. And I am so excited that I was able to interview him because he, so he, he's going into the, you know, the, the post-biological life. That's an area that he's really excited about. And so for me, it, it's just like, uh, like Ray Kurzweil and Werner Vinge and the science fiction that I grew up with. Right. That's, yes, uh, yes. You, you know, that, uh, yeah. Great ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and so to be able to talk with him about that and to be able to go through the, those ideas was so exciting. I, I, my hope is to be able to do a book interview with him also, uh, because he has one that's, I, I believe it's something like the end of astronauts. And he really wow. keys in on a lot of those ideas. So it's quite a mind. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's definitely yeah. one of the greatest of the century, if not at the the millennium, the third millennium. I always forget we are in the third millennium, aren't we? Yeah. Well, and the other thing is that seems like it dovetails into this UAP phenomena because, nice. you know, th th this goes to the Tic Tac. I'm not sure where you're at on that, but I started to, I, I, I personally, I said, I don't believe in UFOs. You know, I've heard all the stories. I haven't seen the evidence. And in 2017, my defense contacts started to gently nudge me and say, Tim, pay attention to this. There's something happening here. And so mm -hmm. as I started to get into it, I was like, well, I don't want to believe in it, but it seems like something is happening. What's interesting, though, is like the more that I learn about it, the more I feel like this may be some kind of robotic probes. I don't know. Have you ever I, I'm not sure where you're at on the UAP thing. Artificial general intelligence is definitely um, very, very important. It, see, it talks to the super force. I have this idea that the super force leads to a super bang, which leads to super intelligence. I truly believe our cosmos, our cosmos, our, our universe is a sentient entity. It has to do a lot with the 99.99% plasma composition. Remember the work of Anthony... I believe his last name is spelled, or or rather is pronounced Perat, but I could be wrong. Uh, Anthony my, Perat. Yeah, my good friend Pete Garretson, and, and you you may know Pete because you you'd know him through Paul Murad, right? right he right. just told I me about. Paul. Uh, yeah, I. I what a yeah. loss. Yeah, you, Paul was wonderful. Paul, yeah, yeah. I, I I can't Absolutely. say it. he was like a second father, but. Um, a great also, man. Yeah. Pete told me about a book about plasma, interstellar plasma, and the mm -hmm. I, I think it was a different author, but they suggested the same thing. They said that these giant filaments of interstellar plasma could act like some form of intelligence. So, I mean, think of our neural networks. Think of the neurons. We have what hundred billion neurons, and we're talking. 100 billion stars, 100, 100 billion galaxies. I believe in the rock's large number hypothesis. 
I think he was onto something, even though these days a lot of our esteemed mainstream physicists totally disregard his large number hypothesis. I believe Paul Adrien Maurice Dirac, one of the greatest minds of the last century, if not ever. Well, so, could, anyway. now could you could you describe that for me a little bit? Like, what what is it about the, the large, large number? number hypothesis has a lot to do. For example, speaking to the superforce, look at equation one. How interesting that equation one speaks to the energy gradient based on, on not only the Planck scale but the horizon scale, the observable universe. I put the numbers there. The mass of the of observable universe on the order of 10 to the 53 kilograms, and the radius, observable radius, is on the order of 10 to the 26. And guess what? The superforce, 10 to the 44 newtons, comes out. C to the power of 4, the whole thing divided by big G. Why? Again, the rock believed that these large numbers, these, these, uh, you could say numbers that are, are, are intuitively part of quantum mechanics as well as general relativity, they play a function in the entire universe and somehow they're related to absolutely our quantum reality. Our mm. quantum reality depends on them. That's why I think the super force is so important. And a lot of people would refer to it as a fifth, a fifth force. I think it's far above that. I think it's the mother of all forces. It's, yeah. it's the one that's fundamental from which everything else comes. But we'll talk more on the super force. Well, it, yeah, I, it, the, the only reason I ask is a lot of these ideas that you're touching on, um, uh, like, for instance, Michael Talbot and the holographic universe, right? That It mm -hmm. seems like that right. might kind of apply here where he was saying there's this there's this fundamental underlying, right, like the quantum foam or something like that, the, the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. And and then we can't perceive that. We perceive a hologram at a larger level of that. And so that right. what you're describing kind of reminds me of that. But then the other part too of the entire universe having intelligence, um, that is something, and I'm, I'm forgetting the scientist's name, right? But the orc or theory, I believe, kind of points towards that. Uh, mm -hmm. Like um, Stuart Hameroff and oh, Roger yes, Penrose. Indeed. The whole right. idea of the microtubules and the, the the foundation of consciousness. I believe the super force can can also help us in deriving a physics of consciousness. I think the super force is essential. People, I I wish people, uh, I wish the mainstream physics community would engage with me on this idea and not just reject the paper within sometimes within hours. Damn, within hours. I mean, it's almost as if they're dead set against it. It's as if uh, they regard it as bogus dogma or, of some sort of, of nonsense. It's not fringe. It is so powerful because it's, it's the Planck force. So, so it, speak, it speaks to quantum mechanics. It speaks to our quantum reality. And yet it does not have the reduced Planck's constant in it, which means it can act as a bridge between general relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, well, there you go. I, I think I think that some of the pushback, I, I mean, I, I'm positive. Some of the pushback that you're getting is you're, you're working in an area that's very intersectional, right? When you get into that, it's kind of an intersection of philosophy and the philosophy of science, as well as physics. And then I think the philosophy of consciousness as well. And, and so that's an area that falls in between disciplines. And I think it scares a lot of mainstream scientists because they're just not sure. But why? Why does the super force feature in general relativity? Einstein's gravitational field equations feature that force. When you do a quick dimensional analysis, a, a, a very rudimentary scaling analysis, on the left-hand side of your GR theory equation, the Einstein field equation, you have G sub nu nu, which is basically the space-time geometry, space-time curvature, let's call it. It's on the order of what? One divided by the superforce times T sub nu nu, which is energy density. You can actually see one divided by, say, L square, where L is a reference length, one divided by L square, is on the order of L divided by E, where L is your reference length, E is your reference energy, times 
E divided by L cubed, which is your energy density. That's the exact uh, rudimentary dimensional analysis uh, representation of GR theory. That's it. So it's right there. That C to the fourth divided by big G is huge. It's on the order of 10 to the 44 newtons and drives everything. Why? It's um, Think of it as a scalar constant. So you can think of it as a, remember, uh, GR, even though it's a nonlinear theory, in the small, in the, um, if you linearize it based on this linear operator, on the scalar operator, this scalar operator times what? Times the space-time geometry, the local space-time geometry equals the energy density. Hence, you can say it's the superforce that is responsible for generating matter, which is energy density within yeah. the local space-time geometrical structure. Everything in, un in the universe, in, th in this universe, has a structure defined by its quantum vacuum. It's, well, it's, it's powerful because Schrodinger spoke to this idea of space-time structure. He actually wrote a, a small pamphlet. Roger Penrose uh, spoke of it at one time, how uh, he regarded this pamphlet to be his introduction to GR theory. It's, it's, it is incredibly well-written space-time structure, small pamphlet that we talk about maybe 50, 60 pages max, brilliantly written. You, you have to read this. It's called Space-Time Structure by the great Schrodinger. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I can tell you, when you sent me that Super Force paper, I forwarded that yeah. again. You, you'd you asked me to send that to several of the physicists, right? Because this is your latest work. So I sent that to Thank several you, physicists that I know. Um, Dr. John Brandenburg, and in fact, I think I sent this last night. Dr. John Brandenburg got really excited when he looked at it. And yeah. Equation it, it, one is so important, in my opinion. And what we... we um, if you ever want to have a, an interview or podcast based only on the superforce, we can discuss equation one and its implication to the mass of the proton. When you put the mass of a proton, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 27 kilograms inside equation one, you get a radius on the order of 10 to the minus 54 meters. Guess what? That's the short child, short child radius. Ah, okay. So in other words, it's the super force that makes the proton act as if it was a black hole. That's why the proton will never really decay. You know, they say that the decay time is very, very, very large. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, this thing will never decay. It acts as a black hole. And why? Because of the super force. We have to revisit vortex dynamics. I think what you're looking at is almost like a huge force. Have you ever seen this thing on your bathtub? You know, the spiraling thing when you take a bath and then you unplug. Yeah. And you see yeah. the spiraling thing. Well, you can think of the outer radius as the event horizon demarcated by the what? Uh, the strong force resides on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So, you know, and, and then this 10 to the minus 54 centimeters is the, the short shot radius, the quote unquote space time singularity, but it's not really a singularity because it doesn't go to zero. It goes to 10 to the minus 54 meters. And this represents what? A black hole. So think of it as a vortex with the outside radius in its um, 10 to the minus 50 meters, which is basically on the order of the, of the proton di uh, diameter. And 10 to the minus 54 being where this the super force makes it act as if it's a black hole. This thing will never come apart. The proton cannot decay. And the super force shows that. Uh, but well, hopefully they will look at least to equation one. Um, yeah. I send my, I really thought they would think about at least review. I send it to classical and quantum gravity journal which is where the Alcubier uh, paper was also published. So it's a, it's a great journal. It's got a great impact. In fact, I really thought three weeks had passed. I really thought maybe they're entertaining the idea. No, no, not at all. Okay. Well, and, again, and it, 
you know, anyway, yeah. John, John's feedback was he, the reason what, what he'd expressed to me and he actually, you know, cause I moderate the APEC conference. I'm not sure if you've seen APEC yes. or not. Yes. Okay. Yes. I do. Yes. Yeah. And you do a and, great uh, job by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're very scientific minded. I, I really think of you as a physicist. That's why I speak to you in these terms and I don't just, you know, well, I, really I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, well, I don't have Tim, the level of you, knowledge. You definitely to... have the technical aptitude. I've I've heard you comment some very strong physics, or I mean, you you have the knowledge. So please trust me when I say you you have physics ability. Oh well, thank you. Not thank only you. That, but I... you've done a lot of work with ionic winds. You you did. A lot of practical yeah work it, it goes it goes back a long ways i've, I've had a lot of exposure yeah. to it you know and, and again working with like the stave conference and and you know again paul murad i mean paul was i, I would say a oh, formative a influence man. for me so um yeah yeah i yeah. missed yeah i i He's the only I, one that looked at my paper called conditional possibility of spacecraft propulsion at superluminal speeds he actually read that paper through and through. Had some great comments. I was able to answer all. Of, he really said this paper should have published should have been published in a much you know much higher impact journal. But I published it where I could get it. It's so difficult. Do you know that paper took me almost four years to get published? Mm, okay. The additional possibility of spacecraft propulsion at superluminal speeds. And I actually had to put in the abstract, this does not violate special relativity. Otherwise, they would not publish it. Now, did, did one it of the things... Realities. One of the things that Paul used to do, especially when he was in the STAFE conference, but even after, even after he was just retired, I guess... Um, people like yourself would send him scientific papers and he would yes. work with them to help rewrite and review equations yes. and get them into journals. I, I'm not sure. Did he work with you on the papers at all? No, uh, he just, he, he really loved that paper. He said that paper should have been published in a much higher impact journal at the time. But uh, I was, he, he, he was, he always had positive. He was actually the only one. I remember, oh my goodness, compared to Eric W. Davis, oh my goodness, the, the comments I used to receive from this gentleman. And I regarded him in very high esteem. I still do. I do. They were almost personal at home, you know, at home in them. Like, yeah. oh my goodness. I'll just leave well, it at that. Ev yeah, uh, everyone has personality. Dr. Putov is a much better, I mean, he's a true gentleman. Dr. Putov is. La creme de la creme, as they say. So, I mean, the men published in Physical Review letters. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, what What can I say? That's the, I, I actually, I remember writing him an email saying that uh, most likely if he would have not been associated with the, um, remember the remote viewing stuff and all that. Uh, they would have conferred a Nobel Prize on him for that paper alone. That's entirely uh, the possible. And then you, yeah. your work goes to the Super Force. Um, I, I, I think it, maybe it was Todd Desiato, someone else. When they had read your paper, they'd said, this is tied to Hal Pudoff's work with quantum gravity, right? Polarizable vacuum. Uh, Dr. Putov, when he saw the Superforce idea, he, he saw the toe, uh, the Theories of Everything podcast, he was, he immediately said, wow, this is a great idea. This makes so much sense. And I haven't heard from him since, but uh, I, I was, I mean, to, to receive such accolades from the man, you know, I really regard him as one of the greatest in the field, yeah. especially yeah. in the field of uh, field propulsion. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He no, he has done so much. One well, day he will be regarded as such. I don't understand why, um, why all this derision of the uh, UAP phenomena. Even, but anyway, again, let me state that I come here as a private citizen, and my ideas, my opinions are my own, and not the United States Navy's. Let me state that officially, Tim. So you know why. Uh, <sighs> Well, and I, I, you know, I, I would. So UAPs is very, very important for study. 
should not so be dismissed out of hand like some gentleman in a certain office that I shall not name. Okay. 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 <laughs> so it, so- it yeah. sounds like you are leaning towards kind of the ET. Well, it, it could be many things, right? And uh, so maybe ET, uh, other people have said time travelers, other people have suggested dimensional travelers. So Lord only knows, but. Put it this way, extremely advanced civilization. Yeah. Possibly Earth-related. Who is to say? I mean, the whole idea of these things just popping out of water, please. You see what I'm saying? You never know what's down there. I do what? We have, what, more than 75% of the Earth's surface we have not really explored. We don't know what's down there, what the capabilities are, what what exists. What if this is a a civilization that's always been here? What if? Uh, Dr. Kevin Newth did a paper, I think, about a month and a half, two months ago, and he was he was revisiting the Drake equation and trying to update mm-hmm. some some ideas behind it. And one of the things that that he had kind of hypothesized was that. Th- if again, if, if ET civilizations, you know, either biological or post biological, if they were out there exploring, they would have found us. But his his calculations suggested that they may have found us four hundred thousand years ago. And so, what you're saying is similar to that, where it, regardless of the where they don't forget what they found in caves. How you 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 telling me that was myth? Uh, some some people's interpretation of some some moving celestial object, uh, an Oumuamua type uh, uh, celestial object. Please, come on, man. I mean, yeah. the thing looks exactly like what Bob Lazar described as the uh, so-called sports model. And by That's the way, the super force, which is unbelievable, it actually talks to almost three D printing out of the quantum vacuum. The super force 3D prints material objects out of the quantum vacuum. Look carefully what the equation is saying. <laughs> and it's Einstein's equation. Just, again, a new perspective on all physics. You have to look at Einstein gravitational field equation from a different perspective. It actually says it is the super force that takes the local space-time geometric structure, acts upon it, and what generates energy density, hence matter. Well, and that was what that was what John Brandenburg had said. He'd said, you know, this. He's like, I've looked at these equations a million times. I've never considered them from that perspective, and that's why he got excited. He said, once I look at it, he's like, I'm not seeing geometry. Now I'm seeing force, and he's like, that is really exciting. So. And it unites something that Einstein took out, the concept of force. Planck believed in this force, and hence the Planck force. It is. The super force is the Planck force. So he was right. This force controls absolutely everything. I I truly believe this, this force is phenomenally important and will one day uh, bring us to a physics of consciousness. Somehow, this super force is related to the physics of consciousness. Okay. That's for another... Another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We well, can talk about it, the Paris effect if you want to. You know. Yeah, it, it, I, I, I should also ask. Uh, so, with the okay. Planck force, one of the questions that I'd heard was, um, those levels of scale are inaccessible to current engineering, right? Like it, it requires so much energy to get there. So, so but then the next. Remember, C to the fourth. C to the fourth. C. What is the speed of light? Remember Maxwell's equations. The genius of James Clerk Maxwell is to realize the electrical permittivity of free space and the magnetic permeability of free space relate to this value of so-called C, the speed of light and so-called free space. But again, even Dr. Puthoff said this can be altered. Okay. The speed of light can be altered based on these and these parameters, and what are they? The electrical permittivity of free space, the magnetic 
permeability of free space. They can be altered. So I believe the super force can, can be at least nudged, if not manipulated. That goes to metamaterials. And that is similar to what Dr. Jack Sarfati has been saying. Now, in, in his case, he's talking about, well, I guess it'd be the same thing. He's talking about gravitational metamaterials. You're, I think you're alluding to metamaterials uh, uh, He's being talking able about to... condensates. I'm, 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 I'm speaking of um, regular material. See, when Dr. Safari says that you can manipulate certain things with a three volt DC battery, I have issues with that because, again, remember what the Pais effect speaks to? It speaks to breaking the Schwinger limit. And you okay. must have gobs, gobs of energy. Lots so the generation of, yeah. of extremely high energy density to actually break apart the, 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 the very fundamental fabric of our reality, which is the space-time fabric. That's what these particles, antiparticles pairs that come as part of Schwinger pair um, production. Hence the Schwinger limit. When you have electric fields on the order of 10 to the, what is it? On the order of 10 to the 18 volts per meter, and you have magnetic fields on the order of 10 to the nine Teslas. I mean, one Tesla is on the order of what? 10,000 gals? Yeah. That will tell you, I mean, with our best superconducting uh, magnets now, Repco type, maybe we can get 30 to 100 Tesla, and that's really pushing the limit. That if we can somehow create a thousand Tesla, see what the Pais effect can speak to. Look at that paper that I published, the, uh, the plasma compression um, uh, fusion device. Okay, okay. The paper I published in IEEE, the transaction of, um, of plasma science, that's actually, Actually, it's gotten a lot of views and even citation, but from who? From Chinese teams. China's yeah. looking into it. Yeah, yeah they do. They people have totally dismissed this work. Equations five and six in that particular paper. Remember, equations five and six in that particular paper. Okay. Plasma compression fusion device published in IEEE Transaction of Plasma Science, I believe, 2019. Equations five and six. Very important. Anybody that studies them and understands the significance of those equations, think of the Pais effect. What, what is a good rendition of the Pais effect? And let's not talk about electrically charged solids because you know it's pretty hard to generate high Coulomb material, even with Van de Graaff, with Pelotron uh, um, generators. It's, it's, it's pushing the limits. Think plasma, the generation of extremely high energy densities produced by what? Accelerated vibration of a non-equilibrium plasma, okay. vibrated at a certain particular frequency, which I shall not name because that's not a good thing to bring up. Well, but that, that, that sounds like your uh, TR3B, right? The, hypothetically speaks to the Pais effect, doesn't it? And once you can produce such high energy densities, remember, your energy density times C, the speed of light of free, in free space, is on the order of what? Electromagnetic energy flux. So your S factor, your S max, can be on the order of a C times epsilon zero, the electric field strength squared. Okay. Right there, you can generate on your huge, huge electromagnetic energy fluxes, speaking to energy densities on the order of 10 to the 25 joules per meter cube. That is breaking the Schwinger limit. That's actually breaking apart the very space-time fabric. That's so what these uh, particle, antiparticle production, that's what it means. You're breaking apart the very foundation of our quantum reality yeah so so if if i'm interpreting it correctly then you're talking about high energy plasmas with basically 
waveforms applied to them. And that would non -equilibrium be Non-equilibrium plasmas, that's a key factor. Okay. Non-equilibrium. So we're talking about, you can call them cold plasmas. Plasmas that do not obey the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the electrons within them. Okay. And that okay. gives you an idea. How could these plasmas uh, be created? Hint, hint, atom, second, femto, second, lasers, among other things. The other easier way to create these. But again, the accelerated vibration of non-equilibrium plasmas can generate these incredibly high energy densities. And once you have that capability that speaks directly to general relativity, to Einstein's field equations, you see, remember the right-handed term, T sub mu nu? Okay. It's really an energy divided by L cubed. That's an energy density. The higher you can get that, the more you can change the left-hand term, the space-time curvature. So the Pais effect, speaks to something the superforce already does fundamentally yeah. because the superforce exists at every point in space and time, but it acts at the Planck scale. This is the fundamental um, greatness of the superforce. That's why it, it is the mother of all forces. It's Planckian in, in nature, but it does not have h-bar in it. It does not have the reduced Planck constant. Hence, you can think of it as a macroscopic quantum entity, a quantum parameter that acts on macroscopic scales. What's another macroscopic phenomenon? Superconductor. How come these things that are seen to flow and you know to float in the skies and so forth seem to have very low temperature? As if, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's an excellent point. Now, one of the things that I wondered was, um, you know, maybe they are actually absorbing energy from the outside environment, right? And and then, you know, other, others have wondered if maybe it's some kind of active camouflage. I mean, there's there's so many questions about that there. Yeah, it's, it it's intriguing. changing the very nature. Um, a great professor, he unfortunately passed away. Uh, his name is Kirsten Huang, H-U-A-N-G of MIT. Person Huang, I think he's known for the Huang potential. It's uh, in quantum field theory. Um, his name is quite established, actually. But he had this idea. He actually wrote a book because he couldn't publish in regular journals, again, like physical review letters. So he published this book called A, a Superfluid Universe. Great. Actually, actually, I give it as a reference in my Superforce paper. I forget okay. which uh, number it is. It could be the last one. Or... Close to the last one. The other one being Schrodinger's space-time structure. I think these two books are essential in understanding the, the potential of the superforce. Uh, Professor Huang had, had an incredible idea. We really live in a superfluid universe. And, and what's a charge? What's an electrically charged superfluid? A superconductor. How interesting. And what do photons do in a superconductor? They seem to slow down. Interesting. So you can actually vary the speed of light. Okay. Okay. It's and again, point. this to to me, this this seems like it dovetails in very closely to what Jack Serfati has been saying. Is that uh, like one of the so one of the things he had said is relativity within I materials. Very small amounts of energy that really worries me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, there are definitely some differences, but it's Unless exciting to see convergence. There's that's, some that's sort the, of exponential run on the power. Somehow this thing becomes exponential in nature. Well, so in yes. terms of power, one of the things that I've wondered about is, um, I was thinking about this last night when I was drafting questions. Okay, uh, cold fusion, right? And, and mm -hmm. the idea was, how can you get these protons close enough together to fuse? There's no way we have to use, you know, massive explosions and all that kind of stuff. And then, then this idea has emerged over the last few years of lattice fusion, right? Where you're using nature itself to squeeze them together. 
And and then there are some other ideas there that I've, I've heard about, like maybe we could look at shear forces where the overall force is very weak, very low power, but you get like a shear effect. You get like a wall of very, you know, high energy, right? But it's very thin. So the overall net energy is small, but you get, you know, shear forces that could cause these things to happen. So in terms of accessing- that's why, that's why the equation one in that super force paper is so important because okay. look look at it it talks to the Planck scale the so-called smallest of yeah. that we foresee scales and it talks to the horizon scale the greatest it talks to them both and they both come that equation can be used for different scales that's how yeah. you get the idea that the proton can act as a black hole and i'm not the first actually looked it up and saw there's a gentleman by the name of Nassim Haramein that first brought that to the attention of the public and they disregarded him, of course, that the proton acts as a black hole. Guess what makes it act as a black hole? The super force. He is not very far off. I'm, I'm, one day, Tim, regard this as a prophecy right here, right now. One day, our high priests of mainstream physics will look at us, the so-called fringe physicists, uh, not in, in my case, I'm an engineer by pedigree. So I'm not even worthy of being called a physicist, not even a fringe one, but anyway, in their mind, of course. Uh, and they will say, maybe we should have looked closer at what they had to say. You should, again, the idea First of all, the divorce of philosophy and physics, greatest, the worst possible divorce of all time. Philosophy and physics must go in hand in hand. Yeah, I no, I completely, I completely agree with you. And I think one of the challenges has been um, it's it's led to this incrementalism. And and the impression that I get is that in many ways it's kind of running out of steam, right? And reductionism, materialism divorcing everything of what could be again super force super bang super intelligence and one day if you have time i can have a podcast with you you know if you yeah want to call no, me i would i would love i would love to do i'll do which i, I, I discuss I i'll do as the, many more future podcasts with you as as you have the time and energy for so the, i call this the triarchy the triarchy of creation Okay. Triarchy of creation, super force, super bang, super intelligence. The super bang speaking, there is a great analogy that comes to this. It is because of the super force that a quantum bounce occurs. I call it an Ashtakar bounce. He's done okay. quite a bit of work on it. Um, Professor Abai Ashtakar, known best for um, uh, loop quantum gravity along with Carlo Rovelli. Now, if you look at the supernova mechanism, there's something called a core bounce. Due to the um, super, I, I mean, due to the strong nuclear force at a density of about 10 to the minus 14 grams per centimeter cube, once the mechanism within the supernova, once the, uh, core starts collapsing, there's a core bounce because of the strong nuclear force at about 10 to the minus 15 meters. I say it's almost the same idea with a super force at this Planckian 10 to the minus 35 meters. Because of this quantum bounce, on an order of 10 to the 90 kilograms per meter cube, that kind of density. So we're talking about a super density. The super, the super force actually speaks to a super density, which has H bar in it. How interesting. But the super force does not have H bar in it. Again, why? But anyway, so there's an, the analogy between the core bounce in the supernova and exactly why the super bang happens due to the super force. And in time, the super bang creates super intelligence. Why? Because of the nature of the cosmos. Again, it's super fluid in nature. But okay. it speaks to a plasma universe. 
we really, I mean, we really have not even scratched the surface of what true physics is. I, I would, I would agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, and, and again, taking things in the larger context, right? I mean, um, you know, what, like when people talk about UAP, for instance, you know, you could be potentially talking about civilizations that are millions of years older than us. And when you look at the majority of, of modern physics, I, I mean, quantum mechanics is just about a little bit over 100 years old now. Right. Yes. Relativity theory, I, I mean, about 100 years old. Right. Yeah, like 1917, yes. I think, yes. you know, around there. So 15 was the prime, the the paper that everybody speaks to. And, and yeah. eventually he made, the, um, for example, the, the Einstein Cartan equation, the whole idea of torsion fields that nobody, oh, my goodness, mainstream physics has a even if you look on Wikipedia, they say torsion field is considered pseudoscience. Yes. Yeah, well, kidding? And, and but but then and, and that came it's out next to the Einstein Cotton equa equations. He's a oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, start. he was trying to so with torsion, he was trying to connect gravity and uh, he was trying to connect gravity and quantum mechanics, right? So we added torsion as that additional dimension. And then uh, I'm trying to think there was, um, but in terms of higher dimensional theories, there's that big one. You talk about the Kaluza Klein theory. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. yes. The Thank whole you, idea sir. of the fifth dimension introduced by Kaluza, and then Oscar Klein came in and said, you know, we can't really see these, so they gotta be very, you know, Planck and in nature. But but eventually, then, yeah. you, this this for me, this kind of comes back to string theory, right? Because. Uh, when I read Michio Kaku's book, one of the things that he had said was one of the inspirations for him to get into physics was he said when when Albert Einstein passed away, I guess they had a camera view of his desk and they said they had the unfinished uh, yes. they had they had an unfinished copy of the, the unified field theory on it, which mm -hmm. which led him to explore that and later led him into string theory. So, you know. Uh, for me, it, it seems like higher dimensions are, are probably the way to go, even though I guess string theory is going to get well, Hilbert out space right now. is what? An n-dimensional space is n approaches infinity. So <laughs> Hilbert space is the space of everything, is yeah. the space of all quantum reality. So why not? Just because we don't see them, we have no... What if some of these dimensions are even uh, of large dimensions? What if there is a way to transfer energy through the unseen membrane between, so let's call it an interface, a sort of surface tension between mm. dimensions? But anyway. Well, and that reminds me of. Uh, this is true word. fridge physics. <laughs> yeah, anyway. uh, it, that, that reminds me of it, the Suskin Maldacena. The ER oh, equals EPR yes, conjecture, right? Yes, but now, yes, now yes. And, and so one and of the things based on ABS equals CFT and ABS anti deceta equals conformal field theory. Remember, later on, Valinda brought to our attention that we live in a deceta vacuum. Okay. We have an expanding universe. Anti deceta yeah. space is not is not physically there, truly. Even though it's such a beauty, mathematical, again, too much mathematical acrobatics trying to pass for great physics. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should take another look. Well, at the it, realities. It, and and er, Eric Valinde, Eric Valinde's ideas are, are very interesting. Very, very interesting. The whole idea that uh, gravitational um, interaction may be entropic in origin may actually have to do with information theory. <laughs> so, yeah, again, the, yeah. all of these are brilliant ideas. Today, we are talking about a new paper that you've written on the super force. And yes, you've sir. written that this is a fundamental force of unification. It can also be described as the Planck force. And it's found in the field equations of Einstein's general relativity theory. And so when you mentioned John Brandenburg a moment ago, I, I did. I, I sent this paper. You had forwarded this to me. I sent this to John as well as a few other physicists. John got really excited. And again, his feedback to me was he said, you know, I'm familiar with these equations, obviously. But he's like, I've never thought of it like this. 
He's like, I've always thought of it as like a geometry. And when I think of it now as a force, this is really exciting. So that's that's what you're talking about with the super force. Um, yes, sir. Can you explain the super force a bit for us, though, in layperson's terms? Sure. Uh, let's look at uh, the Einstein field equations, the simplest way of describing them. A space-time geometry on the left-hand side, uh, demarcated by g sub mu nu, a tensor, is on the order of one divided by the Planck force, which I call the super force, the whole thing divided by, an, uh, I mean, multiplied by an energy density, which is really accounted for by the T sub mu nu tensor okay. in the Einstein field equations. That is the easiest way to understand what I'm talking about. Once, if you see that G sub mu nu is on the order of one divided by the super force, times T sub mu nu, once you put the super force, which is really a, the formula for the super force is C to the power of four, the whole thing divided by big G. So it's really the speed of light to the fourth power divided by big G. Again, big G is really an amplifier in this equation. So the whole thing becomes like on the order of 10 to the 44 Newtons. Again, a humongous force. That is the Planck force, as a matter of fact. Now, what's interesting is that you do not see H bar in, in that, even though it is Planckian in nature and it speaks to our quantum mechanical reality, there is no H bar in it, which means what? Maybe, possibly, this is the bridge between the world or rather the realm of the very large, which is uh, our macroscopic reality linked to what? To the very smallest of our realms, which is the Planckian scale on the order of 10 to the minus 35 meters. What if the superforce unites or rather bridges the two realms? Maybe this is a, a new path to quantum gravity. The whole idea of maybe it's not about quantizing the, uh, the gravitational field or geometrizing space-time. Maybe it's something about something new. Maybe it's about the super force. Yeah. Maybe this is the one thing that bridges it all. And in that paper, equation one is very important because it actually shows the super force can be looked at as an energy gradient at the Planckian scale, as well as on the horizon scale, which is the observable universe. So once you put in uh, energy divided by a reference length, which in our case would be 10 to the 53 kilograms, which would be the mass of the observable, observable universe, divided by a radius on the order of 10 to the 26 meters, which is the radius of the ob observable universe, you get something on the order of 10 to the 44 newtons, which is what? Which is the super force, which is the Planck force. C to the power of four divided by big G. Yeah, so this and is- It's like on the order of 10 to the minus 10, something like that. Yeah, yeah. The, so this is the unification force. This is the, 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 the great unification. This is the unification force. And at, as a matter at of fact, the Planck scale, yeah. Yes, sir. Within that paper, if you look at uh, chapter three of the paper, uh, it, it's a very short paper. It's only three pages long. So on the second page of the paper, you can actually see that at the Planck scale, you can actually show the strong nuclear force equals the gravitational force, equals the Planck force, equals the super force. So the super force is, is both the strong nuclear force and the gravitational force at the Planck scale. So the super force acts absolutely everywhere, at every point in space and time at the Planck scale. So at this 10 to the minus 35 meter scale. Again, the strong nuclear force acts what? On the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, hence femtometer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so in April of 2016, you filed a patent for a craft using an inertial mass reduction device. 
comprised of an inner resonant cavity wall, an outer resonant cavity, and microwave emitters. So in the patent, you discussed microwave resonance within the cavity, creating a polarized vacuum outside of it. And again, this, this touches on so many ideas that we're talking about today, right? Like Hal Pudoff, the polarizable vacuum, um, you're talking about the changing the speed of light within materials. Um, so is is that would you would you describe that as being inspired by the superforce or did your work on that lead to the superforce? I guess that was actually inspired by Maxwell's equations, a simple scaling dimensional analysis of Maxwell's equations. I realized that you could actually write the electric uh, field strength as sigma divided by epsilon zero, where sigma would be surface charge. Um, um, yeah, the surface charge density uh, divided by epsilon zero, epsilon zero being uh, the electrical permittivity of free space. And your uh, B field, your magnetic induction, uh, which is usually given in Teslas, your B field would be on the order of mu sub zero times sigma, a characteristic velocity. That speed, that that speed, that velocity is really can be written as what? As different frequencies of your harmonic oscillator. And as a matter of fact, there is uh, uh, when I, uh, we had a patent examiner interview where I actually explained the derivation of this. Once you, uh, once you realize the electric field divided by the B field is e equals to C, which is what Maxwell regarded, you can see why I'm saying that one way, one rendition of the Pais effect is really what is the production, the generation of extremely high energy densities produced by accelerated vibration of a non-equilibrium plasma vibrated at what? At a particular frequency that I okay. shall not name here, but a plasma physicist will see what I'm hinting at. And as a matter of fact, equations five and six in that plasma compression fusion device paper that was published in 2019 in IEEE Transactional Plasma Science, equations five and six in that paper are essential toward driving the point. I do not understand why these patents were called disinformation, misinformation. Then again, maybe from the point of view of the adversary not getting ideas, they should remain in that realm. There you go. But yeah, this, well, uh, this I, is good physics. Yeah, you know, I it, it was they good physics. I, I think <laughs> the the challenge was I think what what got people was you you came out of nowhere with the patents and they had mm -hmm. military stuff stamped on them, right? They you had the navy and and so people were like. Where is this coming from? What does this mean? And and at the time, oh, so many rumors. They were like, who is this man? It was insane. You know, they're like, is this a black project? You know, is he building UFOs? Is the U.S. Navy, you know, secret space force, the whole nine yards? It was all out there. All these so. were theoretical in nature, with the exception of we actually tried to show the production of high electromagnetic energy fluxes by using something called the high energy electromagnetic field generator. The whole idea of spinning these things, of things like uh, electrical charges on the order of one coulomb, we were trying to get one coulomb, uh, sped up to uh, 100,000 RPM. So we're doing yeah. about 10,000 radians per second. I saw a video. Make a square term and you'll see what I'm talking about. I think I saw photos so. or video of that. I think I saw a video of that, right? The H-E-E-M-G, yeah. I yeah. think. The, the, the H-E-E-M-F-G. The now, did, did you see magnetic field generator? Yeah. Did you see anomalous results when you tested that? It is true that, uh, uh, and I can say because uh, the results were unclassified. So, uh, and uh, the Navy actually came out and said uh, the bias effect would not be seen. Um, yeah. But there were two very interesting anomalies that occurred, and anyone that can get their hands on their report, which because it's unclassified should be able to be out there in the public, uh, under public sc scrutiny and so forth. 
that your work connects to so many different areas, right? I mean, it, re- it truly does, especially, you know, I, I've done interviews on so many different areas and it's amazing. The it, it, bias effect can actually be used to nudge the super force. Why? Because it talks to breaking the Schwinger limit. The whole idea of the Schwinger limit is the, basically the, 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 the breaking apart of the very foundational nature of our quantum reality. When these particle, anti-particle um, pairs are formed, what you're doing, you're tearing apart the very fabric of our so-called space-time, even though some say now that, uh, like Nima Arkani Hamed saying that space-time is doomed and so forth. Again, space-time still goes because GR speaks to it. So on certain scales, space-time is still alive and well. Well, yes. now, have you thought of doing future experiments, right? Because you had, so you had the generator and, but I mean, there are so many more potential future experiments. So, yeah. I, I I would love to be able to, uh, to do certain things, but uh, my present work has absolutely nothing to do with either the Pius effect or the super force. So these remain, um, yeah. Oh, just, uh, well, I, and, and, but maybe not within, I mean, you know, maybe again, one a, day, who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I was going to say, as a, as a private citizen, also, right? Like just after hours, like like. Uh, you know. I would rather put it this way. I am so. I have such strong belief that this physics is correct. That I know certain effects. I would rather not. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, it, it's too. This is something that has to be done in government laboratories, and skiff and highly secure company. Yeah, just leave it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I. But the physics. Are. Look carefully at the physics, and you'll see this is not the basis of this information. Not at all. This speaks to foundational Maxwell's equations. Actually, the heavy side version of Maxwell's equations. Well, those beautiful it, it, four equations, four unknowns that Oliver Heaviside truly, it was him and Josiah Gibbs that were responsible for bringing the mathematical nature, the quaternion nature of, of Maxwell's equations to the practical physicist, to the electrical engineer. Oh my goodness, the original Maxwell's equations uh, were quite intransigent in nature. Very so. God bless Oliver Heaviside, and thank goodness that he existed. Amazing man. Again, he he had problem with mainstream physicists as well. They thought of him as a crackpot, even though they used the Heaviside function. But that's not well. They you know what was the saying? Science moves forward one funeral at a time, right? I mean, I I think the mainstream. Yeah, I think there is no need for people to die. Just people should just have the ability to to and i know i'm using a cliche by saying thinking outside the box just just permit yourself new perspectives on all physics permit those perspectives and all of a sudden new horizons open just think new perspective this is not new physics this is a new perspective on all physics why not? I think that is one of the hallmarks of 21st century science and technology is we, we've already identified a lot of these fundamentals, right, in terms of physics, in terms of engineering. And, and I think one of the things that we're seeing is we're looking at them with fresh eyes and we're making yes. new conclusions. That's just the feeling that I get in so many different areas, you know? Yes, it is. And, and the whole idea, for example, the nature of the plasma. People speak of liquid plasmas, of cold plasmas. Yeah. Everyone associates plasma with an extremely hot gas. You need the interaction, extremely high temperature. I mean, the whole idea of the sun being a ball of plasma. Well, what if there's such a thing as cold plasma, which is really a non-equilibrium plasma, where the electrons are somehow stripped off the nucleus, how? By electromechanical effects, possibly electromagnetic effects. Okay. These lasers can do it. Again, what's a cold plasma? 
it, it means really uh, one that has electrons that are not in a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. That's what cold plasma is. You do not need to have the plasma state being extremely hot. And, and to the, there are ways. Also, the idea of liquid plasmas. There are people now actually studying those. So, now, now what, so everyone what associates ones? plasma as a fourth state of matter. Hence, there's, they're thinking it has to be past the gas phase. So, well, what if plasma can also exist at the interface of the phases? Remember, I my my strong belief that it's it's actually the 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 the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, spontaneous uh, um, breaking of the phases of uh, that actually brings in new energy, uh, an amplification of energy effects because of certain things that we may not understand at the, at the present time, because again, sometimes the mathematics is extremely difficult, extremely yeah. transcendent. But what is not, what if it's not about the mathematics? For example, I was able to find this by a, a simple dimensional scaling of Maxwell's, of the heavy side version of Maxwell's equations. So what if there are other means of looking at the mathematics and understanding the intrinsic physics rather than the mathematical gymnastics that passes for great science at certain points in time. So, yeah. Well, Sal, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has been a true honor having you with me. And let me again, thank you for your career of service, which has again been truly remarkable. Um, I want to ask if this new paper on the Superforce is a signal that you'll be doing more and more openly on your research in the future. Are we going to see you hopefully on more podcasts, doing a little bit more science in the public eye? And uh, what should we be looking for in terms of Salvatore Pais in the headlines? As a private citizen, sure. But if the government wishes me not to engage, then I, I will not. I, yeah. I, I regard myself really as a servant of the people. And the government is the leader of the people. So if the government says that certain things should not be done, then I shall not. But if the people, as a unified voice, as a force of unification, as a super force, demand that I should be seen more and heard from, then I respect the people. They are the true master of civilization. Without the people, there's nothing. So God bless the people. And, and, and God bless you, Tim, for the service you do to us. These interviews are amazing. I've watched every one of them. So thank, oh, thank you for so your much. service. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sal, thank you again yes. so much for your time today, sir. Sir, honor is all mine. Have a wonderful day.